Um, how's everybody doing? Did everybody go to the pub crawl last night? Somebody? Nobody? Anybody? Some of us are a little bit slow today, so we hope this uh, presentation goes okay. So just to make sure you're in the right room, we're talking about uh, Drupal on a dime today. My name is Jennifer Holes, and this is Ben Coder. And just a little bit about who we are. Um, I'm the director of sales and marketing um, for a full ser service Drupal design and development agency. And we're based in um, Vancouver, Canada. And my partner here, Ben. Yeah, my name is uh, Ben Cother, and I'm the, the lead developer at Image X Media. And the CTO. And transitioning in the role of CTO, yeah. Um, so basically, we tried to focus these present, this presentation on sort of two sets of people. One would be if you're a designer slash developer looking for strategies to build a Drupal site, uh, cost saving, time saving, um, budget saving, whatever. Um, and then the other is if uh, you're actually a client interested in building a site with Drupal and looking to kind of leverage those things as well. I mean, just get like a show of hands. How many people here are kind of like in the designer developer camp? And then other people, are you from organizations potentially looking to use Drupal for your sites? Anybody like that here? Okay, so a nice mix of everybody. Um, and basically why we're here is uh, just to kind of go over some of our experiences with helping clients um, build sites that are cheap, fast, and good all together. So where this all kind of started um, at our company, the way that um, we started looking at new opportunities and new ways to take on kind of lower budget jobs was, uh, this was actually from a prospect that had contacted me and he said, in looking for a developer, I've found that there are an equal number of single person companies who cannot handle this job as there are multi-person agencies who will not work for less than $20,000. Unfortunately, neither of these is the right fit for me. Um, as an agency, we're about 15 people, about 10 of those are developers. And a couple of years ago, we said, you know, listen, we can't take projects under $25,000, just the way that our team is set up. It just proved to be too costly and budgets were getting run up because we were treating each individual project kind of like starting from scratch and working with that client to kind of I guess lean towards their needs versus trying to kind of instill and force upon them some strategies that could help them get what they want but at you know a good budget within a good timeline at a, at a good price. So I don't know how many of you uh, read the oatmeal. Are you guys familiar with the oatmeal.com? So this is like one of my favorite <laughs> comics from the oatmeal, how web design goes uh, straight to hell. So it's kind of the idea where a prospect comes to you um, as me, the salesperson, as I'm vetting out potentially taking on somebody's business. You have a you know a couple of calls or a couple of face-to-face -face meetings with the client, and everything seems great. You kind of outline their expectations and you you know collect your requirements and based on what they need, you say yeah sure we can do it in X amount of price. And then we find right from that moment on when it gets to the development stage, all of a sudden, all this other crap gets thrown into the mix and soon you're finding your scope is getting out of line and your budget's getting out of line and your timelines are getting pushed back. So one of the things that we started doing with clients is, uh, you know, I am a unique snowflake. I think you guys, anybody who's designed and developed a website, it's like somebody will come to you and be like, no, I've got the best idea. It's like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter all rolled into one and it's totally unique and there's nothing like it out there. So it has to be a total custom build. No, like that module sounds great, but I need it to do this, this, and this. And that's kind of like the first stop that we are putting on clients. Like you're not a unique snowflake chances are something's been done before. How can we take something that's been done before and make it work for your unique business needs to give you the most value at your ridiculously low budget that you've made us work with? So again, fast, cheap, and good. You're always hearing you need to pick any two. You can't have all three. So what some of the things that Ben's going to go into in a minute is just talking about strategies within the design and development stage where you can get all three. So 
So um, you can't always uh, get what you want. Um, there are certain red flags that usually come up uh, right in the beginning stage of uh, of projects that we that we have with uh, with the clients. So um, we wanted to share a couple of those um, uh, with you, and also kind of like how to how to approach uh, these red flags uh, if they come up. And and one of my absolute favorite um, that um, sometimes comes up is that uh, a client will say to you. Well, I want to switch to Drupal. I see all the benefits of, of using Drupal and, and open source CMS and all of that, but I want that my site at least works the same way as my old system. Um, it, it at least should look like my old system or have the same functionality as my old system. So that is that is kind of like a first red flag that, that you really need to address right away because if they want to have something that is exactly like their old system, why do they want to switch in, in the first place? It doesn't make sense. Um, this will create um, later on just it will be more time consuming to try to recreate in Drupal something that was built, for example, over years as a custom PHP system. Um, and easily, you can easily run out of budget uh, if you're trying to, if you're going along with a client there that has that expectation. Uh, and actually also a little bit uh, further on to that, uh, today at uh, 12.30 there's also another presentation called I'm leaving you at the risk of dumping your old CMS for Drupal. And how do you manage them? So if you're um, if you're someone who actually is thinking about uh, doing that, uh, switching from your old CMS system to to Drupal, that might be also a presentation that is really interesting for you. Uh, to, the thing to keep in mind and to really um, uh, make sure that the the client is is getting that is that every CMS it doesn't matter if it's Drupal or WordPress or, or Joomla or if it's something proprietary, it has its idiosyncrasies. It works its its certain ways, it has its strong points, and it has its weak areas. And um, Drupal might be a little bit plain out of the box, but uh, you all are aware of like the, the multitude of modules that are provided by the, the, by the community and that are out there. So again, thinking about that concept of I'm a unique snowflake, which is not true, chances are that someone already has built something that addresses your needs or your client's needs. Um, now, will that solution that is already built uh, fit 100% to the requirements that you have now? Well, chances are that this will not be the case. Um, but um, I don't know if you're familiar with the 80-20 rule, uh, that you can get about 80% uh, of, of your requirements done for 20% of, of, your, of your budget. Um, if you think about that, then this is a really good starting point uh, uh, with, the, with the project. So the idea would be to reuse already contributed modules instead of recreate modules or recreate functionality just because there's one little piece that is um, Okay, we're, we're trying to... Can we, we were using the microphone, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Is that, is that any is that better? Is that any better? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, now, where was I? Um, yeah, so the, so the idea of, of reusing functionality modules that have been already uh, built, that are already out there, uh, instead of recreating something completely new just because it's there's this tiny little bit that is not how you envision it to work. Um, and I'm also going to go into that a little bit later as well. Um, another red flag that sometimes uh, comes up um, during the initial uh, discovery is uh, if someone is saying, well, I would like to my site to look or work like Amazon or, or Facebook. Well, if you're on a tight budget, that's probably not possible. And it's really important to make clear that these sites haven't been built within like one project phase over like two or three months. These sites have grown over years and years and have improved over years and years. So that is something uh, to keep in mind. And also other things that uh, sometimes um, uh, clients like to to slip by a little bit on on the site is uh, well we have this little in-house system that we use and we just need to to have like a little connection to the to the Drupal site but it's nothing big um, 
it's pretty easy. It's just a CSV file, and in the end, it's it's turning out into like a full-on live connection to um, their MS um, access machine that they have sitting somewhere without an internet connection in their in their office. So those are things that you really you need to kind of like make sure to iron that out and to make clear that. It might sound simple, but to make sure that your client knows that uh, no, this is actually way more difficult than than what you what you had in mind. Also, another one that we hear from time to time is um, that someone is saying, "Well, we want the site to basically manage our day-to-day -day business front." End. So it shouldn't be just like a website that shows information. It also should also completely handle all our business on the on the back end side. So if you hear something like that and they're coming to you and say, well, we only have uh, uh, $20,000, then y you might have to talk with them about their expectations that they have regarding that. But coming again also to the 80-20 rule, and as you see on the slide here, um, you just might find what you need. So a client might have uh, the great expectations of how things should work, might not be familiar with the, with how Drupal works and, and some of the, the ways uh, that uh, Drupal does things, but um, it is important to help the client to understand like, well, you know what, give it a try. This is what we can do within the budget that, and within the timeline that we have. So have a look at it because even though it's not exactly what you envisioned, it might be exactly what the people that work on a day-to-day -day basis um, really like, or that this is actually really the thing uh, that they would um, that they will find beneficial. So I, I put this slide up because um, I think it's really hilarious when a when a web project gets started and you kind of pick out your your point person in the in the company that you're working with who acts as their project manager working alongside our project manager and then things like IA mockups so like wireframes or design mockups or as we're in agile development doing sprints and we're having things tested all of a sudden these other voices start coming into the mix and before you know it like everyone has got their own opinion of how things should work. And you've already discussed the requirements with the, with the client and outlined them, but now that they've passed it around to more people in their organization, they're coming back with more and more requirements that are just blowing the scope out of the water. And no word of a lie, we actually had a client who said he just wanted to show um, the design to uh, his sister because his sister did design in a magazine like 20 years ago so he, she should have some input into like what this looks like and she came back with a whole bunch of little changes etc cetera, etc cetera, where it's like go ahead and collect that list of requirements but table that and have the one point person and try and keep as few people as few key people involved as in the project as possible rather than sending it out to the whole company for feedback so a couple of key departments are the people that should be representing the new site and getting a prototype out there built to kind of get people playing with rather than everybody saying oh well if it just did this if it just did that leading to scope and, and budget creep and further to what Ben was saying about a site like Amazon, Rome wasn't built in a day. You find clients that when you, we were in the past a few years ago, we were taking a waterfall approach to projects. So we were taking on projects anywhere between 50 and $150,000. Um, and then the requirements just started growing and growing. And when a project is that big and it takes like six months to a year to complete, you're finding that by the time that six months comes around that their business or maybe even their requirements have changed. And now you've spent all this time building something that may not even necessarily be relevant anymore. Um, so we've really got, obviously we've embraced agile development, like I'm sure most of you in the room have as well. Um, and we really encourage clients, even if budget's not an issue, to prototype small things and explain to them they're kind of going to get a more vanilla version, but they're going to be able to um, get their hands in and test and like Ben said, be able to figure out Drupal a little bit more and figure out what they like and don't like, and then sort of add those Lego blocks in rather than building this big Lego castle and handing it over and it might not even be relevant to the client by the time that it's done. So the idea there, just, you know, prototype and build upon the smaller thing that you started with. 
and I'll start off with this one and then pass it back to Ben. But you know, the proof is in the is in the pudding. Everybody in a company, when you when you're working with a with a site and when you're working with your business, you have sort of an inside intricate knowledge of everything that you're doing. But you start to forget what the people who are actually using your site are using it for. So our thing that we're always trying to push on clients rather than try and get a million requirements or features, functionality, different design things, social media, etc. Start with something small and then get feedback and, you know, spend the budget where that feedback has come so your site makes the most sense to the people that use it. And again, if we uh, think about, for example, Google, Google started out as a search engine and not started out as a repla as an online replacement for Microsoft Office. So uh, things like that have developed over over years and years. And um, just wanted to mention like two uh, real life examples um, where where it makes sense to to break it down into these stories and into these different phases and really look at what is really important in the beginning for your client or for your company. Um, so um, imagine the requirement, well, if I, if, I post a, if I publish a new blog post, I want this to be sent out to, uh, to Twitter and on the Facebook page and on Google+, which is a valid requirement. And there are modules out there that will help you to, to do exactly that. Um, it's not a big issue, but if your client or your company don't even have a Facebook account yet or a Twitter account yet or working with Google Plus, this might be something, those might be like five to 10 hours that actually would be better spent on something different. The ability with Drupal is there. That's a, that's a nice thing. And that's a, the thing that needs to be uh, made clear. The ability to, to do that is there, but is this really the most important part that we have just because it is really fancy and you would like to, to have that as a, as a feature? Um, or is that something that can be pr uh, put uh, a little bit on the side and in the end, if there's still budget left or maybe in the next phase, this can be used? Um, Another point also regarding prototyping and, and regarding the, the other slide that we had with you might not get what you want is uh, content workflow. Uh, Dries mentioned the workbench module for uh, Drupal 7, which is uh, it's, it's a really nice addition and really powerful. Um, but your client or your company might have a very um, complicated workflow about like who should be an editor of, of a node and who can approve if that node goes live and, and how about then revisions and, and all of that. So that might be really complicated in your case and you might not be able to absolutely uh, replicate that one-to-one -one with, the, with the workbench module. So prototyping in this way would be that you're trying to get as close as possible to that required workflow with a module like Workbench. And then you let the client go in and you say like, okay, here's, here's a prototype and we set up the Workbench module and all its support modules in a way that, we've, that we think is as closest to what your company is doing. And then actually let the people that need to do the approvals, that need to do the reviews, uh, let them have a week or so to, to play around with and see how it works, uh, see how the Workbench module is, is approaching things. And again, then you might actually find that people come back and say, like, this is absolutely horrible, this is not working for us at all. Well, okay, then you can address that. Or they might say, this is great. This is actually exactly what we need. And in reality, some of the approval process is actually not happening online and there's no need to have that approval process online uh, because that approval process is, is happening offline. So this is kind of like the also, again, the 80-20 approach and trying to break down these the big picture into the smaller uh, little pieces that can be achieved easier and again might be something that uh, your your client actually likes the already the way it is and how um, money and time can be saved um, so a different op a couple of different options that you can go as a company 
or as a uh, as a development shop as a developer so how can you how can you achieve that um, to to be really cost effective uh, here and the nice thing about Drupal there are a lot of different options and different ways um, how you can uh, save time and money um, the first one that we wanted to highlight as an example are um, you could use uh, fully hosted solutions and we just have uh, two examples here there there are a couple more out there um, that you could use something like Subhub or Drupal Gardens. Um, so this is a great way to to get your feet wet uh, if you want to try out Drupal in a really easy way. It is set up within minutes. Um, depending on which package you choose, uh, it's also it's also free. You might find some unique features in in these in these products. Uh, if you have uh, a Drupal Garden site, you might have played around with the theme builder there, which is. Uh, pretty nice and uh, if you had a chance to look at Subhub for example um, they did an, an amazing job when it comes to UI improvements and really making something trivial like uh, placing a block a block um, really easy and intuitive um, and using that also brings the advantage that you have um, hosting and support included in the different packages that they offer. So um, for smaller projects, that might be the way for your organization uh, to start off with. And at any time, you can also take these your sites away from these providers if you want to grow later on. Now, this is also going a little bit into like the, the concept we have listed here, uh, limited to the features provided by the service. Well, it might be that that already has everything that you that you need um, but if you want to ha add other modules uh, it is possible in some of the services or if you want to have custom development added to it um, subhub for example then uh, offers that that as a as a paid service to to continue to develop your site for you but then you also have to keep in mind that when you move the sites away from those service providers, you might lose some of the features. So for example, if you, down, if you have downloaded a Drupal Garden site and uses locally, you will find that the, uh, that the theme builder, for example, uh, is, is, is lost, right? You don't have that anymore. Um, one other solution are Drupal distributions. Um, there are a ton out there and they're really nice ones. Uh, open Public, uh, Drupal Commons, uh, Atrium. Um, these are all solutions that you have that have a ton of features. They might already have more features than you will ever need for your organization or for your client. Um, even to the point where you would need to disable uh, some of those features. Um, they're right there for you to download. They're easy to install. They all come with their all in, uh, install profiles. Um, there's uh, training and, and support and documentation usually provided on, on the company's websites that provide those distributions. And as it is basically a, a Drupal installation um, that you have full control over, you have also full control over extending uh, these features and adding your own modules uh, or adding any custom uh, development that you need later on. But if you're looking from, a, uh, from an organization that is looking for a, a Drupal website, on the, on the con side, you of, of course have that you need someone uh, who knows how to set up like a hosting, for example, uh, how to install Drupal. So it's, it's not just a one-click thing like with the fully hosted services. Um, and in some of, those, some of these distributions, you have a bit of a steeper uh, learning curve in order to uh, to get things done. So that is also a really good solution, not only for developers or development companies, but also for organizations that uh, look to use Drupal to look at the distributions that are available out there and use those as a starting point for your project and see what you can already leverage there and what has already been created there for you um, and use that for your projects. But then um, another thing also to, to mention for um, developers and development shops is again to think about what we said before and not to try to recreate, reuse things and don't uh, recreate things. So um, if you build functionality for, uh, for your clients, think about if you can put that into a, into a feature 
and uh, set up maybe your own feature server, which is done really easily. Um, keep your features that you create um, for yourself so that you can, in the end, reuse it. So that is, for example, something that, that we at ImageX Media have uh, started, uh, what Jenny mentioned uh, a couple of years ago, that we said, well, we, we, we're building that that news news and event sites over and over again for our, for our clients right so how can we make that more cost efficient how can we make that quicker and it's like okay well you know what let's let's build a feature that has all the views and um, all the content types in it uh, that we that we reuse all the time and then if it's if it's necessary we will adjust that for that specific client um, but that is something to keep in mind um, use tools like features like strong arm in, in order to um, to create um, to build up your own repository there are also features available on drupal.org so you also can give those features back if uh, if you see uh, fit or use some of the features that are already out there and, and created in, in order to cut down the cost uh, for yourself and for your client yeah I mean uh that's basically how we got to a place where we could do fast, cheap, oh. and sorry, can everybody hear me? Um, that's basically where we got to a place where we could do fast, cheap, and good. And in essence, what Ben was referring to at our company, ImageX, we created um, sort of like a Chinese menu base where we had the same clients or different clients asking us repeatedly for the same things, knowing that within each of these clients that they have specific requirements that they always want tailored and you know, going back to the unique snowflake, well, no, it has to be like this. But if we can take them, what we've built, and kind of ha handhold them, and you know, from our point of view, push them into using stuff that is already in existence, they can have this. They can leverage what at one point cost us a lot of money to build, and is actually you know quality features and functionalities and sites, but for a fraction of the cost if they're willing to stay in line with our kind of Chinese menu of options. And in doing so, we found that now we don't have to, we stayed away in the past from taking on these five, 10, 15, 20K clients because we just would find them a nightmare because we were always doing these things where we were allowing them to push us into building stuff that was uniquely for them, which just obviously isn't feasible within that kind of a budget. Um, but once we started with this IXM base and kind of pushing clients in the opposite direction, it's actually added a decent revenue stream for our company and it's filled in pockets of you know capacity and development time because our developers can pump this stuff out with their eyes closed because most of the work has been done. We're just slightly altering it for the client, but then um, hand-holding the client to say, listen, it can do this, this, and this, but you can't get it this way for the money that you have, but get something out get it tested, get feedback, and decide where it makes the most sense to spend the money and if the requirements that you thought were really important to your business actually are providing business value based on real life feedback. What did you think? That's it. <laughs> questions? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the with Drupal, the answer is always, you know, can it do this or can it do that? Well, sure, it can do anything you want, like how much money and how much time do you have? And then that's when you get the answer of like, well, I have 20K and I need it in six weeks. And then that's when you got to get realistic and say, for 20K in six weeks, here's the things that we can um, do for you. So you're definitely juggling between different clients' personalities. And for some people that might not be the right fit. A client will be like, well, if you can't do it exactly how I want it, I'll go somewhere else. But more often than not, we'll find those clients will come back in the end and realize that like no one's going to do what they want. Or if somebody says they're going to do what they want within their budget, they've made a grave mistake and will re regret it later. So you're definitely changing profiles depending on you know the customer's particular personality and requirements.
Do you want to answer that one? Um, yes, it's sometimes it is an issue. Um, the the important thing is uh, to really um, to really have that clear with a with a client beforehand, kind of like um, and really explain them what the agile approach means. Uh, if you have these um, uh, smaller projects, sometimes you will not get around like to do kind of like a hybrid solution where you, you kind of like agreeing to to a fixed price but you you do a bit of an agile approach as in like okay um this is the fixed price so this is the limit that we're working in now let's break your requirements into all the little stories and prioritize them and then let's let's go through and you see how much time we spend and um how things are progressing and and after your first sprint or so, the client has a has a product that he can work with, and maybe he's changing things a little bit. But then you need to also make clear to the client is like, okay, you know what? We will let you know once we are reaching 90% of our agreed time. So we're reaching the end of, of what we what we can do uh, with within that within that limit. So sometimes it, that is uh, it, it is a bit tricky, but sometimes you kind of like need to uh, try. Um, yeah, a mixed approach there. I think something we also try and do when we're estimating to give clients an idea instead of, I mean, we'll break things, the way that we work is we'll break things down by line items and show a client like how much, you know, time is being spent on each particular feature and requirement. But another thing that we try and do, especially when somebody has a lack of Drupal knowledge, is we add a column that says, you know, percentage of core functionality or, you know, like existing module functionality. So something that in their head seems like a really minor requirement could be like, well, that's only 30% core Drupal functionality. So what you're asking for is going to require 70% customization. And that gives them a better idea in their head where the biggest you know, time sinks of the project are going. And we found that's been really helpful to show people. And so many clients just think that the things that they're asking for are so little and meaningless. Why can't they just be done? I just, I just want to like write text in line, no big deal, you know, whatever the requirement is. And then when we show them, well, listen, this is how Drupal works and what you're asking is moving X percentage away from the core. But here's what the core does. What can we do within the core or within the contributed modules that's going to get close enough or you know maybe even extremely close to what you want to do if you're just willing to back off of a few custom things Um, I mean, it's a bit more difficult in a, in, a, in a smaller budget to do a proper discovery phase. Um, but if we don't have the time, typically we'll set aside anywhere from 15 to 100 hours for discovery. That's typically for larger projects. But if you say have a 10 to 20K budget, we'll do our best to understand your requirements. But what we really try and do is outline in writing all the things it will not do. Um, so you know they have a requirement i don't know like i i want social media on their site and to us you know if we don't dig deep into that it's like oh, okay we can just throw up links to twitter and facebook but then it, later on they'll take that and be like no i wanted feeds i want it you know like dynamically displayed on these pages etc cetera, etc cetera. so we'll say okay social media does not do this 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 but we'll do this so really making you know a point to I mean, in sales, it's like get everything in writing up front because, like you said, assumptions will be, you know, misunderstood between the client and the person building the site. So we try and actively outline what the things are that it will not do. And that, I think, helps us stay out of trouble in a lot of, in a lot of projects where a requirement that you think is simple can all of a sudden become really ambiguous and complicated. 
find uh, for your uh, cheaper clients that Subhub and Google Gardens work? Would you find that because you're big enough, you can host it yourself, and that's so what we've created, which we've um, sort of dubbed internally as, as launch kit that we're hoping to, we haven't decided yet if we're going to do like a distribution or software of a service with it, but right now it's kind of IXM based, IXM is just short for Image, ImageX Media. Um, we find that that's kind of like a combination of the Subhub and um, the Drupal Gardens. But I mean, that brings about an interesting point in certain situations when it's a simple site, like let's say some kind of brochure site, but maybe with some like an events calendar and a blog or something, we'll just build it on Drupal Gardens and like not, if it's going to be more of a hassle to explain what Drupal Gardens is to the client and sell them on the benefits of Drupal, we'll just build it on Drupal Gardens and they're none the wiser and we've created them a site that they think is, is beautiful. Does that answer your Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, uh, oh yeah, sure. Um, do you want me to go ahead and repeat it for you? She, she was, she was asking, saying that as a, as a project manager, she finds it difficult when a, when a client pushes back, if she were to say, well, no, we're not going to do that, that that would create animosity and potentially throw the project off. And, uh, I'm not a project manager, I'm a salesperson, but, um, like I find, with an upfront contract. So first of all, some of the things that we just mentioned about what it is that you're delivering and what it's, it's almost more important to say what it's not going to do versus what it is going to do. Cause those are the things that you can point back to the client and say, we told you it's not going to do this. We can do that, but it's not in scope. Um, but we as a company have went through a fair amount of, I'd say project manager turnover and we really realized we needed people in the roles with the strong personality and reminding clients that in coming to us, you, you know, you, you sought us out because you said you wanted Drupal experts and the advice that we're giving you isn't because we're trying to, you know, save us money or screw you out of giving you something, but we're, we're trying to give you the best advice possible for your budget, what you're trying to build for, you know, business value priorities. We want the freedom and, and we seek out clients that if they come to us with a really, something that we think is a really terrible idea, that's a flag for us. And then we say, I don't know that unless you're willing to back off of this and maybe start small, whatever, you know, when people, how many people, I'm sure tons of you get like Facebook requests, but it's slightly different, but totally unique, and it's going to be the next big thing, and that's just a flag, and I think that leads to more problems than if you're clearly outlining things um, prior. It's like setting, setting up like a communications standard before the project begins, and then reminding the client constantly throughout the process, I think helps, helps get out of trouble. But definitely a client will... In our experience, it's like, well, it's like with anything, if you think you can get away with something, you're going to try. And as a project manager, we've seen in our projects, if you cave to one thing, that opens the floodgates for way more things getting, getting out of whack with scope and, and budget. And, um, I remember one time where we m made the mistake. It was, a, it was a bigger project, but we were sitting in with a client and they were kind of like, oh, and we would like to have this and this. And we were like, well, okay, it's, it's, it's a larger project. It's probably not going to be that much issue with the, with the budget. And we said, because it was as part of the discovery phase and they, there was one idea after the other, and we were just writing it down. And then we sent the revised estimate and they were like, what, what, yeah, what, well, happened? what happened? What happened here? <laughs> how, how, why does it all of a sudden like went up like? 100 K. Um, and we spoke with the client and we explained it and, and the client was saying, why did you, why didn't you tell me right in that meeting that what I'm asking is so far out from what Drupal core and the contributed module are doing? Because if you would have said that in that meeting, I would have backed off. Oh, yeah. So we you find that you need to in, 
in the conversations with the client to uh, same as with the putting in a percentage of like how much can be achieved of this functionality with contributed modules and Drupal core really gives the client a, a good idea of like where do I add like really extremely complicated things to the to the whole package and and we really learn from that experience to to push back right away at the at the beginning and saying you know it's not impossible but what you're just asking here just increased your budget probably by 20,000 yeah, and I think that was an instance where, like, the client literally said to you, "Like, I'm, I'm, I just paid you to do this discovery because you know you're the experts, and you." And he wasn't being mean about it, but he said, "You know, you wasted my time going down the list of these requirements when you knew this was going to expand the scope by two to four hundred hours. You know, you wasted your time scoping out everything for something that we just don't have another, you know, seventy-five thousand dollars to add for one feature." on the site. Yeah, um, we get a lot of clients that have got a fixed budget but won't tell us what the budget is. <laughs> and it could be anything from a 400 hour job to a 600, just depends on how we decide to build it. If, if you're in those positions, how, how, what, would, what would you tell the client with their, with their secret budget? Would you go towards the lower end or would you go to the higher end and possibly obviously risk being more expensive than everybody? Did did everybody hear that question, or should I should I repeat it? What's that? Oh yeah. <laughs> so you're asking um, if a client has a secret budget, um, and you want to know whether you should bid high or low if if it's fixed. So if you bid too low, you would potentially get yourself into trouble because it's fixed. But if you bid too high, you might price yourself out. Um, we try and stay away from fixed budgets would be my first thing. And we're not against doing fixed budgets, but if a client really harps on us to do a fixed budget, we'll say, um, we'll take it time and materials and then we'll like multiply it a couple of times because we're going to pat ourselves, you know, to, to protect ourselves. But from a sales perspective, I would bid low, but with the caveat of, forcing them to do a discovery, which I think is is absolutely necessary in a in a fixed bid project. But yeah, like low ball, but then with like giant caveats all around it saying like this could go up once we go in. But when they will tell you what they But I mean that's kind of that's kind of folly in its in its own, right? Like I, I don't like playing the games of, of the secret budget because that signals a client that is price shopping like for a commodity. Yeah, like they so like and in understanding that in business, if you're in a slow time, you might have to potentially take on a job. But right there, that's a flag where someone's being I, I at least try and get ranges out of clients. So I'm like, it can be super broad, but, you know, like if someone won't won't share a budget of any kind, then. And then so within within like so this is like a government type bid, right? So are they are they making you sign off on that bid once you've submitted it saying yeah, like that to me is like giant red flag, like especially because I find governments are they'll take an RFP for something that wasn't web related at all and just change like building a shed into like replacing that with like web design just because they're working off of standard templates um, and we we got ourselves into a lot of trouble with a city project in the US same thing where we had to sign off on the bid and they had a, a clear set of requirements but then once the project started it just got ballooned out of the water and we had to we had to sever the relationship at a at a penalty um, but that's that's a tough one and you know our stance as an agency is we won't even submit to something like that unless we've got gaps in 
capacity. I don't think I have like a right a right answer for you on on that one because it is it is a tough one. Did you? Just, just one sorry, second. sorry, just one just second. second. Well, it applies to, like, in software, you can typically get 80% of what you need for 20% of the effort or the budget to build. So if you looked at something, or you're getting 80% of what you need and the other 20% is irrelevant. So if you took like Microsoft Word, for instance, it has like 10,000 features, but you're probably only ever gonna use 20% of them where the other 80% aren't important. It's called the, what is it, the Pathetto the patheto rule? The question was to, to repeat kind of like the idea behind the 80-20 rule. Um, Okay, if I got the question right, so how to manage payment milestones in order to show the client the progress in the project? Yeah, um, so I'd say 90% of our projects are time and materials, and we have a time report system that the client has 24-7 access to, and we, it sounds a bit vigilant, but we track by the minute, and our developers are required to give a description of what they've done within that time. And then we're typically invoicing clients on a bi-weekly or a monthly basis, depending how quickly the, the project is progressing. Um, so the client's getting a really detailed summary of everything that's been done. So even if within a one to two week sprint, they might not have something that seems tangible that they can get their hands on and really get into, they're seeing where each minute of work is going and, and the status of where that particular feature is within the development cycle. Does that, does that answer your question? Um, <laughs> our, our developers do get stuck, I'm sure, like everybody else. Uh, I think if, uh, if, we, if, it's, if it's within scope and we said we could do it and then the developer gets stuck, we won't charge for it. We call that, we, we'd have our developers file that under resolution um, so the client would never see where those hours, like wouldn't see those hours. Um, but if it is something that the client has popped in as a new requirement and research would potentially be required to figure out a solution, that is typically something we'd bill for, unless we knew it would take like kind of half an hour of going to drupal.org and finding an appropriate module or what have you. And, and also regarding that, um, it, because the because our clients have this uh, the ability to see where the where the time is spent one of the important things and in, in the beginning uh, uh, of working with them is that we also let them know it's like okay if you expect um, five hours spent on on this item and let's say 20 hours on this item it could be that the developer is a little bit quicker with this item and but the time saved here is spent on another one that in the end is a little bit more complicated than initially initially thought but um, if it if it really is to the to the point where where it is because a developer doesn't know any any further and it, no one else can and requires quite a bit of time then that would be can um, logged as, as non billable so the client wouldn't wouldn't get those hours
Okay, so the question is regarding um, if a client comes and they don't necessarily have a budget, they just put in the requirements and then they want to know how much that costs. Yeah. Um, usually what we, what we do there is we give them, we, we try to, uh, to get as, as much information as, as possible uh, beforehand before we get back with an, with an estimate. And then usually also what we have is a, is a, a low, medium and high number. Um, what we think the different uh, functionalities that they requested will will be, so that they get an idea of like um, to, once we get into a discovery phase with a, a client like that, we always would say like, okay, let's do a discovery phase um, even afterwards in order to make sure that we're all on the same page. But then we would say like, okay, if this is really if we understood you right and everything is going fine and we can use module A and B for this, this will take 10 hours. But if it turns out that there is a little bit complication in there because it needs to work together with a different module and we might need to do some custom work there, this easily could be 30 hours. So they get a range, like a low and high range that they have right away to get a better idea of uh, um, where the risks lie in the, in the different um, line items that they have. And if you have this along with the, with the percentage that you, that you think you can handle that with Drupal core without custom uh, development, that usually gives the clients a really good idea of, of uh, where risks lie and where hours could easily go uh, go up or or stay steady and then from there you, we would go into the discovery phase to really um, to narrow down all of those uh, of, of those items and to to see that we are on the same page there but even after the discovery phase you often cannot you know, fix 12 hours for this requirement or 15 hours for this requirement it's still this you know, from 10 to 15 or 10 to 20 hours if if the customer wants a fix a fixed bid in, in that type of scenario, like if our if what we think it's gonna be is ten hours and the worst case scenario is twenty hours, we'll like fix the bid at forty hours. <laughs> like we'll we'll really, really pad it because we and and we've shown we've been able to show proof to clients where clients think think that time and materials means like you say it's going to be 200 hours and you'll just run up this giant budget and by the time we're done you're going to present me with an invoice for 600 hours but we've been able to show time and time again that um, in a lot of cases we're coming under the hours because we have padded a little bit and that time and materials works out cheaper than fixed bid unless you've gotten yourself into a really bad fixed bid scenario where you've fix something that you knew like that you knew you shouldn't have based on the on the scope of the project. So if you're not doing a fixed bid, you start developing with the permission of the clients uh, with the information that it's from one hundred to one hundred fifty hours and the client pays and we then would really Yeah, like what the hours are actually tracked at and we we changed to that model I think about maybe like nine months ago. We refused to give an exact amount of hours anymore just because we know little things come up even if we've done our best to to get all the requirements we've done the things where we'll say it won't do this it won't do that things can still come up and it's like it's I don't I don't know it's it's not like you're I don't know what would be a good example it's not it's not a commodity right like it's a service that you're doing and I find it's hard to pinpoint the exact amount of hours, even if you've done the same task over and over again, it's never going to be perfect. So to me, it just doesn't make sense to have hours and say, yes, this, this is it. If you didn't want to show that range or the client is against seeing ranges, then my advice would be to show them one number, but it's the padded number, right? Like the high number. So the question is, if we calculate uh, the project by by hours, is that okay? Yeah, I mean, um, in I'd say ninety nine percent of the time, we'll gather their features and requirements, and by each line item, we'll assign hours. Probably 
the only scenarios we don't do that is uh, we've had a couple of government jobs in Canada where uh, like a, somebody's come to us and literally said like we want this five page brochure site that we know is going to like cost $2,500 to build. They're like, well, we only have a $50,000 fixed bid. And in that case, we'll say, all right, yeah, we think we can do it in 50000 And <laughs> then we'll come in at like 49000 and make them feel good and, you know, the government. But that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a far and few between scenario. It's just a little secret. <laughs> I mean, we, we don't have blended rates or anything like that. So we, so depending on the project and the risk level, like we have a bare minimum profitability that we have to meet, but our rates are typically between 125 and 200 an hour. Um, but if, but yeah, Canadian, but we won't like, we, we won't quote different prices within a single quote. So, um, at the lower end, sometimes we give, uh, discounts for, educational institutions that are working with tighter budgets like just as an example um, but basically our hourly rates are uh, complexity of the project and when I say complexity is because we would have all senior developers on it and they bill out at a higher rate than or we're paying them a higher rate than um, somebody intermediate or junior like a junior person can bang out a five page brochure site like that so I can typically quote on the low end using somebody like that but if it's complex we need to quote on the high end and that's strictly for like just meeting profitability right what is the time you spend on the um, well like I said in in the past couple of months we've been taking on these smaller projects so from the the 5 to 20k model we can like bang those out in like two to three weeks um, but our sweet spot in projects is kind of like 50 to 150,000 and those range from two to six months um, and the timeline can obviously vary substantially depending on how fast the the customer is moving anything else Josh you got a, you got a question for us Josh no. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thanks guys. You.